So thank you for the introduction. So my name is Elisa Donati. My, my picture was not on the list of the speakers, but I'm here. So if you want, you can speak with me during the coffee break on the lunch or during lunch. And today I want to present to you uh, the general, general introduction about neuromorphic engineering and some application. Especially I want to speak about some biomedical application. So, but first of all, I want to say thanks to my team, because of course it's a team effort. So I want to say thanks to my professor, Giacomo, Giacomo Indiveri, and to my group, the Neuromorphic Cognitive System, um, and then especially to some postdoc and PhD students, particularly to Melika, sorry, to Melika Pai, one that we work together in, uh, in this biomedical application. So I guess that many of you already know about neuromorphic because as he said, so apparently it's a really important thing, important thing right now. And one of the reasons is because we have, there is a lot of attention on this idea of neural networks for implementing artificial intelligence. So there are not all universities, but also big companies like Facebook, Google, Intel, uh, IBM, and Samsung that are investing a lot of money in trying to find a way of applying this kind of neural networks for artificial intelligence also in hardware. And neuromorphic engineering can be one of the possible solutions in which we can implement this kind of network. And the second reason, because I guess you already, you already heard about the neuromorphic uh, field, is because, uh, as you know, there is this problem of the big amount of data that we have right now. So in 2017, the amount of data that we, uh, that's been pro uh, produced, they were pro produced, is more than 10 zettabytes. Um, and the problem is, uh, if you think about the energy that you need to process this huge amount of data, is more than 10% of the total uh, energy that is produced. So we basically have to find another way of to process this data. Uh, otherwise, we can waste all the power uh, only processing the, uh, this, uh, the, the communication, the processing of the data. And we, they estimate that by 2025, there will be more than 50 billion of Internet of Things devices, because you know this is the new trend. So the idea is to build this small chip, these small devices that are specific for some specific task, and so they produce data, they need power, and so we are basically the amount of data and the amount of power is going to grow a lot. And uh, uh, exactly one year ago on Nature, there was this article about a possible revolution for this uh, big data um, analysis. And I think, and not only me, but also big companies, they think that the neuromorphic engineering can be one of the solutions to solve this problem. And at INI, so the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich, where I belong, basically, uh, we have this uh, mission since many years. And so the environment is really high interdisciplinary. So we have uh, biologists, uh, physicists, uh, engineers, uh, computer neuroscience, and we work every day together to find a way of basically uh, understand the brain, so understand the nervous system, and to find a way of modeling and reproducing on silico. And um, we take, we want to basically exploit this physics of the silicon and of some nanotechnology, as for example, the memory system, maybe some of us knows about the, uh, the, this uh, new technology. And the idea is to basically uh, to investigate the stochasticity of the uh, uh, synapses and to try to use these devices to reproduce uh, this feature and uh, uh, to reproduce basically in silico, to have a hardware that is able to do, um, to have these capabilities. And um, so the hardware that we produce at INI, they are basically mixed and analog and digital, where we have the core of the system that is analog, and for the core we basically uh, think about neurons and synapses. And uh, we use uh, any kind of other digital system to provide the communication and to map this specific uh, network on a chip. And, um, but this is only, if you only, if you are, you're not limited to create this kind of chip. What we want to do is that we really can use them to interact with the real world. So we make this chip, we put on some neuro agents, some, some robots, some drones, and then we go and test what's happening in the real environment. But then if we want to really take inspiration, so where we take inspiration from uh, designing our chip? So we take inspiration from nature, some, from animals, and we don't have to think so some big complex animals. But if you start for this, some, this is a small animal, like a bee, and if you think about the 
computing hardware, and the, let's say the brain of this animal. And if you think of the dimension, so the brain of the bee is uh, one milligram, is, uh, the dimension is one, square, uh, one cubic millimeter, and the number of neurons is less than one million. And right now, in our chip, we can have more than one million. So we can build basically some chips that have more uh, neurons than the one that we can have in this kind of animals. But then, even if the brain is so simple, this animal is still able to really perform really complex task behavior. For example, it's able to move really fast, uh, to have this really fast and fine motor control. It can move in a, and interact in real time with the environment. And it's also able to recognize some complex spatiotemporal pattern and is able to, uh, uh, to, to some cognitive computative abilities, like the Abbas thought and symbolic language. So if we want to find a way of basically solve the problem of this data, uh, data analysis um, that we have right now, so we can really find, take inspiration from the nature to have this uh, radical paradigm shift and start to build a new kind of computing hardware. And the idea, and in the big, the big difference that we have on the romorphic chi compared to the standard von Neumann uh, machine is that in von Neumann machine we have a computing system, a computing block, and a memory, and they have, they are, not at the same place, so you need the bus of communication between them. So you need to send data, and you have to send that as fast as possible if you want to have a, a fast system. And this is a sort of bottleneck. So, but here, in this neuromorphic hardware, we don't have this kind of problem because the the computing block and the memory, they are co-localized, so they share the same place. We don't have any kind of bus of communication. And um, uh, we have many nodes. If you think about the neuron as a node, so we have many of them that they work in parallel. And working in parallel, we don't even, we, we, it, we don't want that all of them they work together. So we just need a few of them they work. So we basically make this a sort of sparse activation of the neurons. And in particular, we, it's enough if you have the 30% of activation of the neurons to, to uh, perform your task. And another really difference from the von Neumann architecture is that in the von Neumann architecture, the time is a sort of abstra abstracted time. So you have this clock, so it's not a real time. In, uh, in, um, in the romantic chip, what you have is you have a continuous time. So you are really using the time. The time represents itself. And uh, in this way, if you are able to build system with the same time constant of the real environment, we can really make two systems that they speak the same language. So they are inherently synchronized. And so they can re you can really perform the task in real time. And uh, you don't have to yeah, create a sort of not real time. And uh, um, this makes the system low power with a low bandwidth. And there is, there is another feature because these systems are really low power, is because they are even based. So this system works only if there is an input. So every time that an, impu an input comes, there is a reaction of the system. In case you don't have any input, the, the, the chip is completely silent. And so for this reason, you have, uh, there is another feature to, have a, um, to decrease the power consumption. But so how these chips are made? So basically, as I said before, there is a core. So the core is analog and is subthreshold. We work in subthreshold. And uh, I'm going to explain you what does it mean, subthreshold. So uh, analog this core is basically what we have usually is an array of neurons and many, many, many synapses that we use to configure different networks and we use to connect different neurons. And uh, all this kind of this system, um, you have to think of this system like um, so, the, I mean, um, it's a, a threshold system. So you have, every time that you have a spike, so you produce a pulse in the system. So it's, uh, what we use is something that is exactly what we have in the brain. So in the brain, we communicate by using spikes. And here is more or less the same, because every time that a neuron produces spikes, a digital sequence produces a pulse. And this pulse is used to communicate between neurons, and is also used to communicate between different chips. And uh, it's a, a threshold system. And um, as I said, so if you want to really um, communicate with the environment in real time, you need the same time constant. And so what we are trying to do is basically to try to slow down silico, so try to have the same time constant. That is something that is not easy, but I can explain you some circuit that can do it. And, uh, uh, but there is a limitation on all this. I mean, there is a limitation. The limitation is that you have many nodes, so you have many neurons, many synapses. And these systems, they are noisy. So one of the problems is that you have 
mismatch when you produce this kind of chip. So not all the chips, they're going to, not all the neurons and synapses, they're going to work in the same way. So if you want to work in a safe way, you have to add some extra features to your system. And one possibility is to add some adaptation and learning circuits. So using this adaptation and learning, you can adapt and learn from the environment so you can basically save the work of uh, the working, I mean, the functionality of your chip. And um, so, since it's, a threshold, it's a, a threshold system, so every time there is a spike, there is a digital pulse, we need a digital circuit. So we basically were a little bit opportunistic. So we use uh, the core, the analog part for the core, because we can take advantages of low power and uh, low bandwidth, and we use the digital part for the, uh, for the communication part. So, um, and since we only have pulse when there is a spike, so the system, we don't have any clock, the system is asynchronous. And we design our own circuit for the circuit asynchronous part. And um, we also use this digital part basically to create the network. Because when you have a chip, you basically have many neurons, many synapses, and they are not connecting together. But if you want to connect them, you need to speak with the chip. The way we are using is the chip is uh, the digital part. So we use lookup table, uh, FPGA to um, map our uh, network and configure some parameter of the, uh, of the network. And by using the analog and the digital part, we are safe, so we have a system that is full tolerant to the mismatch. So here, this is basically the, our queen or our king, so it's the basic elements for the for, uh, for designing analog uh, subthreshold uh, circuits. So this is a transistor, and as many of you know, so if you apply a voltage between the gate and the source, and then you go to measure the current between the drain and the source, you can see that this is the relation, this is the relation that you can find. And there are, you can see there are really two parts. So there is one, is called above threshold, and one that is below threshold. In standard digital uh, designing, they, you use this part of the circuits, because you want to be really precise. You Want to have the really exact value of the current. But in 19, Carver and Mead and other researchers, they started to have a look at this part of the curve, at this part of the relation. Um, because here, you have extremely low voltage, because we are talking about order of millivolt, and you have order of nanoamp of current. And also, another characteristic of this part, if you look at this part, you see that the relationship between the voltage and the current is the same exponential relationship that you can find actually in the model of Hodgkin and Duxley uh, for the proteic channels of sodium and potassium. So you can have the same, you can reproduce the same behavior of nature, of the proteic channels. And then one of the reasons is because basically you have the same kind of um, working principle, so you're working with diffusion. When you work in protein channels, you have diffusion of ions. When you work with transistor, you have diffusion of electrons. So, uh, and then you can use this transistor to build your circuits. And especially if you take many of these transistors and you start to connect them together, you can start to have uh, more complex behavior. But here, if you look at these circuits, if you look at these circuits here, sorry, uh, here, this is only six transistors and one capacitor, and this, this system is able to emulate the same behavior of the synapse. And this is called differential pair. And the, this system works if you have an input of pulse, of digital pulse, and then in output you can go and measure this current. And this current can be the EPSP current that you go to measure on the postsynaptic part. And if you look, this is the biological measurement. And if you see, the shape is exactly the same. And the time constant is order of millisecond. So in this case, this kind of system, this kind of circuits can really interact with the environment because the time constant is the same of the real world. If you look at here, this is order of milliamp, and here is order of picoamp. But this is because uh, uh, it's really difficult when you go and measure with the oscilloscope. It's really difficult to measure picoamp. So we had to increase the weight, so we had to increase the, the, the amplitude of the current. But actually, in output for the chip, we can really have the same picoamp. What you can say is the difference is here. So if you see here, it's a little bit, I mean, it's steeper compared to the one in biology. But then you can make the, the system a little bit more complex. Eh? And so you can, add, you can subtract two of these differential pairs. So you have two output current. You can subtract them, and you can have this alpha function. So increasing the complexity of the system, you can really match the same behavior of the nature. 
And the, another interesting feature is that uh, this kind of synapses, they have either linear than nonlinear properties, because by adding an input here, actually free uh, transistor and other cup, you can have this behavior that is called short-term depression. So the short-term depression is when you have a spike, a train in input, and this really high firing rate, and then your system starts to fire a lot at the beginning, and then it starts to sort of adapt, and it start, uh, and then here it starts to fire a, a lot at the beginning, and then it decreases. And then you can really see that you can also have in this particular chip. You can also have the opposite behavior, so the short time facilitation. So in the other case, it's basically the opposite. So you have that your system start to find more for each input. And all the, both this kind of behavior you can, you, you can have by adding other few number of transistors here. But now, if you take even more complex systems, so you take a differential pair, you put together, you, you take other transistor and you create the active uh, system, active circuits, then you can have this circuit here that is basically a neuron. So this here reproduce the same behavior that you can have in, in a neuron. And if you solve the equation, uh, so these are, you take the current for each of these transistors, you solve the equation on the, each node for the Kirchhoff flow, so you can find that this uh, neuron is uh, an adaptive exponential integrating fine neurons. And here, you can see that it's really, it's really fit in a nice way the experimental data. But then, as I said, so you have many blocks, uh, all these blocks, they have different features. So in particular, this one is the one that is called adaptation. And uh, it, the adaptation is the principle that you see here. So the adaptation is similar to the short-term depression. So you have a situation in which your neuron fires a lot, and then at some point it decreases the firing rate. And then you can even, you can really increase the kind of uh, uh, time constant, really long, and you can arrive at order of more than 100 milliseconds. And this feature, the adaptation, is really important. And recently, at the latest NIPS, uh, I don't know if you know, but Volta, Wolf, Wolfgang Mass, he presented a current neural network that it was uh, hey, basically by using this uh, adaptation, it was able to set some time constant in the network of order of seconds. And this is really good in a recurrent neural network if you want to, if you need memory to make your task of classification. And so I'm really happy to see that our chip that can implement uh, this feature. So we can really use them to implement this kind of network. And then here you can see there is another block, this one in particular is the activation and inactivation of the sodium, and here there is the activation of the potassium. And them together are basically in charge of the positive loop in the neuron and the reset of the neuron. So now here I want to show you another example of, uh, of uh, neurons. So there are many different, so according with the task that you have to solve, you can use different models, and you can implement different circuits. And this one is, was, is a really old, Circuit. It was proposed in 1991 by Misha Mahau and Rodney Douglas, and is a neuron that is really close to the one with the behavior is really close to the one of the Hodgkin and Duxley model. And but I want to present to you because we are still using this model. In particular, I'm designing a chip with this neuron because it's really important when you need to have a system that has to reproduce the same behavior of the proteinic, cha proteinic channels. And here. This is the output of the proteic channels. So as you can see, this in particular is a sodium. So as you can see, the shape is the one of the, is the, the activation is the one um, of the sigmoid. And this is the bell function is for the time constant. And these circuits that is basically inside here, and this is, uh, we replace the differential pair, the one of the synapses I showed before, with this transconductor amplifier, this is the name, where there is a diff pair plus a current mirror. So we uh, use this system to reproduce exactly the same behavior of the channel. So as you can see here, the output, so the, the function of this, uh, of this system is exactly the same that we can find in the protein channels. And this is, uh, this is the, the cadence one. So here you can see that also the time constant is the same that you, can ha you have in the protein channels. And we use this neuron to implement uh, an adaptive pacemaker, so I'm going to present you later. So now, this is our latest chip. So actually it's quite old <laughs> because it's one year old, but we are still in phase of testing it. And this chip is a, is a, is a processor is 28 nanometers. The dimension is seven millimeters square. And we have basically two different parts. So we have this part that is uh, the one for, we have four different cores with 256 neurons, adapted exponential integrated, uh, uh, fine, uh, um, integrated neuron. And here you have, this part here is the asynchronous 
circuits that I was saying before that we use for communicating within the chip, within the cores and within multiple chips. And here we have non-plastic synapses. But it's in part here, we have less neuron, we only have 64 neurons, but all this block is basically uh, plastic synapses, so we can have all line learning. So here we can implement SCDP, and our chip can really interact and change and learn from the environment. And just to show you, this is basically to compare. So this is, we, when we, we are characterizing this chip, so in particular, if you think about, so this is our chip. And so if you think about, this is the power consumption that we have. And the, I want to show you that our chip is really competitive with the others that are in the market now. So this is, the number five is the LOE, the, the one from Intel. The number one is the True North from IBM. And if you could see them, it's really competitive in number on, of uh, power consumption. And it's also really good if you think about the uh, fan in and fan out. So it means that you can really connect multi multi many of them together. And so you can have a really high number of, um, of uh, uh, chips connected together. So now it's time to say, for this kind of system, for what are good and for what are not good. So this. Um, I want to start saying that we are not going, we don't want to replace any GPU or CPU or processor. We just want, we think that this kind of chip, they are good if you want to have some specific task. So for some specific tasks, you can have, you can substitute the standard GPU and CPU with an neuromorphic chip. So for example, the task we think that they are good for, if you want to real-time processing some low dimensional data, such as um, the pressure, output from pressure sensor, output from vibrating sensor, uh, audio signals, and that they are really good if you need a really fast classification or some sensory signal. So for example, I'm using them for classifying EMG data. And uh, another way, because uh, another reason, because they are really good, if, because they have low latency, because they are really fast in responding. And this is good if you have to take to have to make some decision making, especially if you want to use this kind of chip in robotics. So you can really use them because you can take decision pretty fast. But they are not good for in system where you have to a uh, high accuracy pattern recognition. So uh, now there is this competition from Google and Facebook where you have to try to recognize some MNIST um, classification and then they are not really good for that. So I, should, I, should, I don't use them for, for, this, uh, for this application. And they're also not good if you have a high number of crunching. So if you have a, a, lot amount, a huge amount of data to process in a way that, uh, something, like to, to something like to store for the backup, they are not good in doing that. And they're also not good if you have to this batch processing of data set if you want to send data from some hard disk to your chip, you should use another system. And, but then, once you have the chip, how can you program the chip? So there are two different ways to program the chip. So one easy, it's not easy actually, but this one is to select all and change all the biases and uh, for the neurons and synapses to make the chip to behave in a way you want. And there is another way that is quite new, is to basically design actually to map with the digital part. So some pri primitives, something like, I don't want to go in detail, but something like you can create a winner to call in your network and then using many winner to call to uh, produce even more complex behavior. And uh, I said, I mean, I, I present you something about the adaptation, the one that you can find in the neuron and some short depression that you can have in the synapse. But now I think I want to spend one slide speaking about the learning because uh, there are many chips that can have uh, online learning. And there are recent, I mean, there are many papers about this spiky learning. And they are present, I mean, even from really famous names like Walter Sand, Stefano Fusi. So they basically, um, Brunel, so basically they have this model where they say that for the spike in learning, you can have a super simple system. You just have to have a look to the pre and post sign, uh, uh, spikes and then to have a third variable to check if you need to have spike, if you can or not update your weights. And uh, in this kind of model, they are really simple because they say that you can just need the B stability, so you can only use two synaptic states to have learning. And this is really good for us because if you need something so simple, we can design on chip, so we can have on chip. And then, if you want to ensure the correct behavior, you need redundancy. And this is something that in VLSI we have. So we have multiple neurons, multiple chip, so we don't have any kind of redundancy, any problem with redundancy. And then another feature that we need is the stochasticity. Because you have a huge amount of neurons and, and analysis, but you want to ensure that at least a few of them, they go in the correct direction, so they do what you really want. And this is something that we can have on, uh, on our chip. 
just to make you an example of how this uh, kind of learning works uh, in uh, our chip. So you basically, you have to have a look to the presynaptic spikes and the postsynaptic. If the timing between them is the correct one, and if you have a third variable, in, variable, in particular the calcium variable, that is within a specific range, then you can update your weights. And then you update it in a positive way if your postsynaptic is a little bit after your presynaptic spikes. Uh, and, uh, it, and the other way around, so if you have before the postsynaptic and the presynaptic, so you have the, um, you decrease your weight. But then you have this, uh, up, you change your weight only when you are in this region. As soon as, as soon as you go in this region, then it means that you are not, you, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you have to, I mean, it's a, st a sort of stop learning. So your system doesn't have to update, so you can stop and stop the learning part. So here, <coughs> this is a, a slide. It, actually, this is the slide is a, uh, in one of the tests that we made on our chip. This is not learning, this is memorizing. So the idea is to have a system that can memorize uh, a specific uh, uh, data set. So we use the CIFAR, and uh, the idea is uh, since we have this spiking system, we have to convert the images in spikes. So we took the image, we convert for each pixel in a specific amount of uh, uh, color, and then we send as a Poisson train to our system. And our system, our network actually, it was not even a network, it was a simple neuron. So one neuron received an input. Um, and so there, is, there were um, different neurons for different input. And if you see, after 10 milliseconds, the neuron was able to recognize to discriminate already. But after 20 milliseconds, it was really good, the, the discrimination between the two images. So as I said, this is not really learning, this is memorizing. And if you ask me, about the accuracy of the system is really difficult to, to respond to you because of, of course the accuracy is not high. So we are not talking about deep neural network with many neurons. So here, this is basically a perceptron. So it's a single layer perceptron. It's, a, it's the simplest uh, model that you can have. And still, even in this case, you are able to recognize between different uh, images. And, uh, and we we'll also try to combine many of these perceptrons to have a sort of multi-layer perceptron. And we saw that, the, the, I don't have the slides here, I have in the backup slides. So you can see that the, the amount of the accuracy increase a lot. So we can have uh, up to 80%, even 90% of accuracy. So, as I said before, so you can have different way of programming this kind of chip. I don't want to go in detail of the primitives, I just want to explain you this one, the intrinsic oscillation, in oscillator, um, because I want to show you in a practical example where we use uh, this kind of system uh, for, uh, for, actually it's not a bio, for biomedical application and robotic application. So this network, as you can see, is extremely simple. So you have two population, they have a, a third inhibitory population, so they compete to each other. So if you send the same input to both the population, you can see that they are active at the time. So they switch between one and the other. And this switch is due because you have this thermal fluctuation, you have jittering in this system. So they can basically, even if you, uh, if you uh, remove the input, they are still continuous to alternate this movement. And uh, here there is the result. So as you can see, the firing rate is not the same, it's not constant. They are maybe not even 50 and 50. But then, if you add some extra feature, so for example, the adaptation, if you add some specific, so if you tune in a fine way the biases, then you can really have the uh, this activation that is 50 and 50. And in particular, doing that, you can have this uh, central part generator, so you can reproduce the same behavior of the central part generator. The central part generator is uh, this particular neural circuit that we, that the human and animals use for all the movement that are basically repetitive. So when you walk or, or when animals, they swim of flight or when you swallow, so you always activate a muscle in the same way, with the same sequence, sorry, not in the same way, but the same sequence. So you don't have to, you use this kind of uh, um, circuits, neural circuits, to activate in the correct order or the muscles. And here, this example is the one from the lamprey. So one of the first animals that was studied was the lamprey. Actually, these two pictures are from Stan Greenell. And as you can see, this is the model. So you see many different populations, but actually you can divide them into two big populations that inhibit each other. And here is the measurement for the real lamprey. For this is the CPG for locomotion, actually for swimming because it is a lamprey. So you can see that this activation of the left 
So this is the activation of the left and right side, and this is really uh, consistent. So you have 50 and 50. And then I managed, actually this is quite old work, so because it was doing, during my PhD, I was able to reproduce the same behavior on a chip, and then I used this chip to control a robotic lamprey, but then I'm going to show you later. And if you zoom in to one of these bars, uh, you can really see with the oscilloscope that you really have the burst of activation. And if you want to have a burst of activation, it's a really important to have adaptation of the neuron. So you have to switch off the adaptation, and then you can have, and then if you tune uh, the reset part and adaptation in the correct way, you can have a burst behavior. And the burst behavior is um, actually really important because in, uh, in nature, in our body, uh, in animals usually use this kind of uh, burst activity when you want to send a message that you want to be sure that reach uh, the, 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 the post-inactive part. Because if you have a train of spikes, then you are sure that at least one of these <laughs> spikes they can reach uh, the, the goal. So now it's time to switch or some application. So um, now we have our nice chip, and so we want to try to do uh, to, to 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 use them to some specific task. In particular, what I'm focusing is to study how to use this chip to interact with the human body. So the idea is to basically build a system that is able to uh, measure some signal from the body. Then. Uh, there is this part, this part is the part where you have, since we are working with spike in our network, you need to have spikes. So the input of our system should be a spike, so a spiking. So we need a part here where you convert them and you send to the network. And this network is actually on chip. So uh, this process, we are working on this one. We have actually chip that is able to measure uh, some signal, in particular the one that we made. Actually, we are using for EEG and EMG. So we take the, we take the value, we amplify the value, we convert in spikes, and we send to the network. And so we have many work actually right now in, uh, in our institute. So we have, we already studied this classification of the bird songs. We have this closed loop bidirectional brain machine interfaces. We have the closed loop coupled biological silica neural network. We are studying this uh, HFO, this high frequency oscillation. So basically uh, we, are, we are working together with university, with the hospital of Zurich. And uh, we are studying this kind of HFO because there is, we think that there is a correlation between the HFO and the, uh, some epileptic, uh, epileptic uh, episodes. So if you are able to predict this HFO, maybe we can predict the, the, the epileptic, epileptic attack. So we're also studying the ECG anomaly detection. So if you have ECG, so if you want to see anomalies, basically you have to see at the shape of the ECG. You have to compare two different um, waves, and then you can see if there is some, some, uh, some uh, uh, anomaly. And then we're using a re a recurrent computing for doing that. But today, I want to focus only on the last two parts. So I want to focus on the online EMG classification. And so in this one, that is a really new project. And uh, this is uh, about is to creating a pacemaker with a, uh, an analog subthreshold chip that is able to emulate the CPG. So as I said before, every kind of signal that you have when you want to send in one, one of our network, a uh, spike in network in general, but in our chip, so you have to convert them in spikes. And the approach that we're using is the one that is called level crossing. And uh, in particular for the other part, we use the delta sigma modulator. So the idea, is uh, when you have, this is the Mayo. So for the first, we are using a Mayo. So we also have some, Data, a data set from some nicer electromyograph, but we can still use the Mayo. Uh, it's enough. And so we uh, basically base the, this is the output of the Mayo. And so what we do basically, we go and we look at the shape. So we, we decide a, uh, a threshold of the amplitude and we start to move along this shape. So we go in a delta T if this shape of the our signal is uh, higher than our threshold. If the shape is higher, so we create a pulse. If it's not higher, we don't, uh, basically we don't create a pulse. And in particular, we have two different channels, one for the upper part and one for the lower part. So when our signal goes up, and when our signal goes down. And so for each of these signals, we, at the end, we have two different channels, one for the upper part and one for the, down, for the lower part. And this, we are, they are basically the signal that we send in, the, in our chip. Just to show you, this is our chip. 
So this is the chip I showed before. So inside here, there is not only one single chip, but there are four of them. So here you have a multi-core, multi-chip system where you have 4,000 neurons with um, online and I mean, with uh, online learning. So once we have our spikes, so we can send to our network. For the image classification, we are using reservoir computing. So we are using um, this particular network and we implement it on chip. So we are using 900 neurons. It's, quite, it's a really high number. So basically, we are using one chip for the system, but we can decrease this, uh, this number. And 80% uh, of them are recitatory and 20% are inhibitory. They are connected with the special connectivity and with the Gaussian distribution of the weights. This is, means that you, uh, neurons are more connected, so the probability to be connected to the neighbors is higher, and the weight is also higher. And here, there is a time constant. So um, we have actually, we are using two different special uh, Gaussian distribution uh, for, the, uh, for the excitation and inhibition. For the excitation, we have uh, a quite small uh, lamp, um, special distribution, but we have high uh, weight for the neighbors. And for the inhibition part is the opposite. So we have long lambda, so, uh, and we have uh, really, the, the weight is not so high. And the reason is because, um, what we are trying to do here is to try to create a sort of bump of activity. And to create this bump of activity, you need that the inhibition part is uh, the connection are pretty long because you want that they reach all the part of the networks. And um, so this is our input, so there are spikes. The idea is then we send to only the 30% of the network. We project the 30% of the network, and this part of the network then is connected to all the rest of the system. And, uh, um, the first, I mean, the first study that we did it was basically to see what's happened inside the reservoir, to understand when, what's happened to the signal when it goes in the network, how is it projected in this higher dimensionality. Because one of the features of this recurrent, recurrent network is uh, to have a signal that is uh, projected in a higher dimensionality. So if you have two signals that are really similar to each other, since you project, you can really increase the distance between them. So, these are results from the chip. So the idea, so we take two different, actually we take the same subject, the same trial for the same subject, and we send inside the network. Because we wanted to see if the network was able to understand it was the same signal and to characterize the, 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 the chip. So to see the noise uh, that there is in the chip. And this is the output. As you can see, it's quite low. And actually maybe it's better if I, so basically what you see here, this curve is uh, the, uh, distance between the activation of the neurons within the network. So we studied, we took all the activation inside the network for one specific uh, uh, input, and then we go and measure, com uh, we compare to other inputs. And we use two really simple uh, uh, gestures, so open and close hand, open and close hand. And then we see that when you send the same trials from the same subject, the, no the distance is really low, and this is it's good for us because it means that the network, uh, the chip is able to recognize that it's the same uh, person and, it's, and the same gesture. And then we start to send uh, open and close from, actually I don't remember, from the different subject or different uh, trials. And we, we, then we saw that you see, you have some difference. So it's basically the green for the open and the blue for the close. And you see that there is some movement. So you have some distance inside the network. But then we start to compare open and close. And this is what we got. So at some point, uh, uh, between, uh, I would say, 350 milliseconds and 450 milliseconds, we had this window of 50 milliseconds where the signal it was uh, higher and it was constant. And this is something that we got all the time, so it seems that we really consistent. And so in this part, we know that here we need to do our readout phase. So here is the best moment to uh, go and classify the signal, because we know that they are pretty far in uh, the activation in the network. Uh, this these four blocks here are the perceptrons, so is how the neurons are activated in 2D. So you have to think about the system as a 2D matrix, and you go and you see the activation. And actually, this is something that we want to improve. If you look at it, actually it's not so important, but I think it can help for the classification. So here you don't have any kind of bump of activity. So the activation is sparse. And this is something that actually I, we think that maybe if you have uh, some bump of activity that moves in the network, is, it's easier when you go and do the readout. 
So after that, we made the readout phase, we did the readout phase, in particular, we used uh, this uh, uh, delta rule, and we got uh, for, not open and close only, but for the Rochambeau game, so for uh, rock, paper, and scissor, we got a classification accuracy of uh, more than 80%. But then we, we can still have to improve it. I mean, actually, because we, have, we want to test different kind of conversion of the input and uh, different kind of learning for the readout phase. So now, this is another project. This project is about this pacemaker. So now the pacemaker, they use, basically are using some accelerometer that is mounted on the pacemaker. So when you move, it can feel your acceleration. It can adapt the heartbeat of the, of the, of the heart, <laughs> of the chambers. But here, what we want to do is to basically have a system that interacts with some physiological, physiological data. So we measure some data and we use it as an input for our chip. So in particular, so we are, have to design this chip and this is a huge project, so we also collaborate collaborating with Medtronic and Microsemi, and they are basically creating all the package to have uh, to, to, in a nice way to basically test on animals, because the final goal is to test this chip on animals. And here there is uh, the entire system. So here there is a, basically you can see as two different CPG. So one, this part here is the respiratory part. So this the CPG takes the input from the physiological data. So the, in particular, it takes input from the concentration of CO2, concentration of O2, um, from the blood pressure, from some EMG of the diaphragm, and from the, um, uh, another parameter, I mean, from the, for the lungs. Um, ah, I don't remember. So basically, all this input you send into the chip, so you can really connect them. In a, so actually we have two different ways. So we, you can either convert them in spikes to send to the synapses and then the synapses convert to the current and this current goes to the neuron, or we can really use them as a current so that we take out of the, of the, of the sensor and you can directly send to the neurons. It's something is pretty new, something is a, um, so we are waiting for this chip. So we tape out last year, so we are waiting to, to have back this chip. So then the output of this part is basically the input of the second phase, so the cardiac phase. Actually, in nature, we don't have any kind of cardiac CPG, but since we want a specific activation of the four chambers, we call them CPG. And uh, uh, the idea to make another chip, that it takes the input um, from the, take the output of the respiratory part and activate the four chambers in a correct way. And then this pacemaker, this part is the real core of the pacemaker, and this is connected to the heart. So basically all this part should be, I mean, we have to make it on one of our chip. So, and now here is another, another novelty of this project, uh, is uh, that basically if you know, if you're familiar with neuromorphic chip, you know that it's really difficult to set the biases of the neuron and the synapses. And we are using this particular statistic method, the data simulation, to uh, calculate all these uh, parameters to set on chip, to make all the process much faster. And um, so, the idea of the data simulation is a, is a, st a statistical method, method that it basically takes some measurement from the real neurons and take all the equation of the neurons and combining them is able to extract all the hidden parameters. And these hidden parameters then are used to set the biases on our chip. And uh, by using this data, you can either uh, find all the biases, but you can also um, predict the behavior of the neurons. So you can also see uh, with different Nippon current how your system is going to behave. And this is something really, really new. It's one of the few papers that is, I mean, this is the first paper. It's actually, is a, I, we published it last year. So these are really preliminary results. Now we have really, really good results that we are going to publish soon. And uh, in this case, this is what I said before. For doing this specific data simulation, we had to use uh, not the standard uh, adapted inter uh, exponential integrated fine neurons, but we had to use the other silicon neuron, the one that is close to Hodgkin and Duxley, because we really wanted to check the behavior of the protein channels. So for this is uh, the chip where basically we design these, uh, um, I don't even know how to call them, some this is um, silicon neurons. 
So now, this is some example, they are not biomedical application, this is robotics, because they are actually, I have colleagues that they work in robotics, I actually I'm from Scuola Superiore Santana, I've studied for my PhD in Scuola Superiore Santana, so I study bio-inspired robotics, and part of my thesis was to use the neuromorphic chip to try to control a robotic uh, lamprey. So this is the lamprey, the robot I had when I was in Pisa, and you can see, if you can see here, there are multiple vertebra, and uh, all of them, they have, not all of them, but most of them, they have motors, so you can consider all the system as diff multiple CPG. And actually, this robot is controlled by using CPG, but software. So the idea of my thesis was, okay, let's replace the software part with the digital, with the, with the neuromorphic chip. And this is the model, the hardware model I implemented on chip. So as you get here, it's only three vertebra, but actually you can have even more. So here there is the oscillation phase. Uh, this part is like, like, uh, it's basically at this level, so it's the one that send the input to all the CPGs, and then all the CPGs, they, they are connected to each other. So, and then according with the, the, the speed you send the signal along all the CPG, you have the output speed of your robot. Actually, there is the output speed of the animal and the output speed of the robot. And you also have this phase, that is the feedback phase. So, uh, we could, I mean, actually, I mounted all of them. I mean, I, I was able to connect the chip to the lamprey. And here, so there are some results. So here there is a single chip, a single CPG. And you can see that the frequency that was able to reproduce, they are between, uh, between zero, the range between 0 0.5 hertz and 3.3 hertz. These are not exactly the same that you can find in lamprey because in lamprey it can, be, uh, it can move even slow, uh, slower, but it was, it's extremely difficult to find such a value on chip. Um, it's basically when the, the animal stays is uh, almost static and it's extremely difficult to reproduce it. And uh, it, these are some results that you can have in the delay between the different segments. So with a single, with, by using all the synapses, I could have this delay of 25 milliseconds. But then if you want to have, to, you want that your uh, system uh, moves, I mean the robots move even slow, um, slower, you can use a sort of trick, so you can use some uh, inter-segment neurons. So you send the signal not directly to the next vertebra, but you send to a next neuron, and the neuron is connected to the next vertebra. And by using the integration time of the neurons, you can increase the delay between the vertebra. So you can really have, uh, you can increase the flexibility to your system. So you can uh, have a huge uh, range of uh, speed. And here, so this is what I did during my thesis. So actually, this is a video, but I had problem embedded with LaTeX, so I have, uh, I can show you later. So here, it was okay. Now I have the output of all my CPG. Now I have to take the output and I have to send to the motor. So I have to control the robot. And for doing that, the, what we do in robotics, the standard way is to basically send to the motor, we have to send the PWM. And so I take all this information and I, com I use these electronics um, and I convert them in the, Parallela is the name of the chip, sorry. Uh, so I convert them in, um, in a PWM. But, uh, and then uh, basically I use them and I control the motor. But, what is the but there is a problem. So the problem is that you lose a lot of information because you lose the information of the bursting, you lose uh, the information on the uh, duration of the bursting, the frequency of the bursting. So you lose many, many information. So at some point I, I start to think, okay, why not using the same kind of communication we have in our, in, uh, in our brain also to control the motor. And so I switched between the PWM to the PFM. So as you, I don't know how many of you are familiar with motors, but you know, the, this is the standard way you control the motor. So you fix a frequency and then you go and change the duty cycle or your voltage that you send to the motor. In this approach, in the one that I'm using now, is I do the opposite, I fix the duty cycle and I change the frequency. And then for the motor, it's not a problem because basically it's just an integral. So uh, the motor doesn't feel this big difference. So um, I could use it. The only, the only difference, and you have to be really sure that this length is uh, long enough, I mean, the length, the length is enough for your motor. So each uh, different motor has different length. So you have to characterize the motor before. So, and here there is a super simple network I used to control motors. 
So I had two population for each direction and the target reference. So the target reference is the one that has the speed or the position you want to reach. And then according with the fire rate, you have the, the system that moves in one direction onto the other. And here, there is the result of the characterization of the motor. So as you can see, the output with the PFM, it was linear as the one that we expected with the PWM. And uh, the nice thing about this kind of system is basically it's really biologically inspired because you, if you have a high firing rate, you have a, a high movement, high speed of the motor. Um, but then there is a huge limitation, in my opinion. So since there is mismatch in neurons, so you are not sure that your position or your velocity, even if you have a close look, uh, is not the one that you want to reach. So one of my ideas was to move now, move on from this system with the fire rate and move on some system where you have the ID of the neuron and is the one that is in charge of the position or the speed that you want to reach. And now I'm working on it. And just to conclude, so now we are in the time where we are ready with neuromorphic to go on market. So one of the idea is to try to have system that are basically um, designed to a specific application. And this specific application uh, lets you to have a really small and dedicated chip, a low power. And it's basically it's the new trend that we have now in European uh, in the project that is the one of the edge of intelligence. But then still, as a university, we are still looking at the basic research. So the idea is to study neural circuits, to study the brain, and having this model, and then uh, to try to implement them on chip. And once we have on chip, we want to try to investigate the behavior of this chip by using some specific um, neural agents or drawing some agents that it is the one that closes the loop. So it's the one that goes in the real environment, interact, and then you can really see how the system responds to the real environment. And then you can also use the output of these uh, agents to basically modify your uh, circuit, so modify your principle of computation. So I want to thanks now all the funding, in particular my Marie Curie. So thank you.